Hey, I want to bring you guys in on a new YouTube video. Um, and I think this has potential of being even bigger than the Invisible Children one, uh, which has been monumental. But this one, when I saw it last night, only had three views. And I think it's a shame that it only has three views. It was posted last night at 11 o'clock, and it was our church chairman, Dan Charlin, skydiving with his wife for their 32nd anniversary. And really, we all need to watch this. You know, we all need to see this. Because I tell you, there is nothing that I want to do less for my 32nd year anniversary than go skydiving. There is nothing that sounds fun about that. And I've got to be honest with you, there's nothing that sounds particularly romantic about it either, about being strapped to another man's chest and being thrown out of an airplane. <laughs> I mean, where is the romance in that? Like, where's Janet? You have no idea. You never even see Janet in the video. It's just Dan falling to the earth with a guy like in front of him who keeps grabbing his head and tilting it up so he could film it. And I got to tell you, when you go skydiving on your 32nd year anniversary, what do you do for 40? Aren't you setting the bar maybe a little bit high? Don't you kind of now have to go bigger and better every time? Like you start, need to start running with the bulls and chasing bees and like fighting bears and like, what else are you supposed to do? Like deliver babies in the back of cars? Like everything after this, now it needs to get bigger and better. 50, what do you do for your 50th? Everything now has been thrown way off scale. And I got to tell you, I hope my wife never loves me enough to ask me to go skydiving for 32. I never want to do it. But what I love about Dan and Janet Charlin doing this is that it showed this willingness to do something new and exciting, to keep their relationship fun and playful, and to have always this new element kind of happening in that. And they have this wonderful wonderful marriage. It is a joy to watch them. They are so clearly in love, but they don't settle there. There's this desire to let's continue to do new and exciting things together. So you can go to Dan's Facebook page and watch him fall out of a plane today. I want to encourage you to do that. You know, they leave us this kind of idea that relationships, all of them need to be continually sharpened and invested in and uh, be stretched in new ways because every relationship can grow stale. It can grow stagnant. It can cool. And that is true of our friendships. It is true of romantic relationships of love. And it's true of spiritual relationships as well. That our relationship with God, if we don't stretch and pull and go deeper and invest in it, can in fact cool. That can in fact grow hard. That it can in fact fall apart. And we know this because we have experienced this in our own lives. We know what it's like to have our own relationship with God sort of cool and sort of calm. In fact, we talk about this a lot here at church. Think of how many songs that we sing that talk about God set my heart on fire. Like we have a lot of songs that deal with fire. In fact, if you are new to this church, you might be wondering, what is wrong with these Christians in fire? Why do they want to burn everything? In fact, when you take our songs about burning and blood, we become a very strange group of people. Yet somehow we understand that feeling of God, my relationship is cooling and I don't desire for it to cool. I in fact desire for it to burn, for it to be on fire because we have felt that way in the past. We know that when we came to know Christ, that our hearts in fact burned with the good news that we experienced. It burned with the joy that we had and we desire to get back there because it is the nature of things that our hearts cool. In fact, if Paul must teach about it, it must be apparently far more prevalent than we ever thought. So today I want to take us into Romans 12. It's going to talk not just about how we get our hearts to burn, but in fact the ways and the, and the work that we need to do beforehand before it can ever happen. I want to ask that you to stand with me as we open up Romans 12 today. Our theme verse for the whole year is Romans 12, 1 and 2. So I'm going to start there. Where we're going to be today is going to be in verse 11. So let me begin with 1 and 2. Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy... To offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Over to verse 9. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil and cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. And for, for today, never be lacking in zeal. But keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. This is the word of the Lord. Let me pray for us. God, we pray that you would move in our hearts. Father, I recognize that we come as people who are probably a little bit off this morning. Lord, the time change, whatever it might be in our lives, Lord, the incredible weather that we've been experiencing, Lord, we come into this room probably fairly distracted. 
Yet, Lord, we also come in with a desire to know you more. Father, we truly do. We desire to know you deeper, and we desire to live that out in a real significant way. Father, would you reconcile the two today? Father, would you take our desires and bring alongside of them habits, Lord, that can bring to life the sort of passionate relationship that we want to have with you? We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You can be seated. <clears throat> Paul begins in verse 11 by saying, Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. You know, it's fascinating to look at other translations of this verse because they try to get at what he's really saying there. Because what really, as you kind of dig through the Greek, what he's really saying there is, when he says keep your spiritual fervor, is let your heart be set aflame. Don't be lacking in zeal, but let your heart be set aflame. Let your heart burn for the Lord. Let your heart be on fire. Let your heart just absolutely be passionate. Let your heart be set aflame for the Lord. You know, over the course of my life, I've gotten to know a lot about fire. A lot of that comes from my time at UC Santa Barbara. The city around, Isla Vista, uh, around Santa Barbara is called Isla Vista, and it's an entirely student-run town. And in student-run towns, you tend to make a lot of mistakes, and one of our best ones was we burned a lot of sofas. Like a lot of couches. Like pretty much every weekend, somebody was burning a couch on some corner of the street. You would think it was grease or something. Like it was this sort of crazy thing that all of a sudden everyone was doing. And you came to see so many couches being set on fire by rowdy kids that you kind of started to get a sort of idea about whether or not this was going to be successful or not. Because you could tell whether or not they were actually doing it right. If you want to light a couch on fire, you better make sure, first of all, you have the right couch. Don't try to set one of those faux leather couches on fire. It's going to be extremely difficult to do. If you're going to try to light a couch on fire, you can't just have lighter fluid for your barbecue. You need gasoline, and you need a lot of gasoline, and you're not going to just be able to do it with matches. You're going to actually need one of those little clicker lights because you're going to need a sustained flame onto this couch to actually make it burn. Not only that, but we have to take into account how liquid your state of mind is if you know what I mean. Because chances are you don't logically get to burning couches on your own. You need a little help. And so it depends because it's very easy that instead of lighting that couch on fire, you're going to light yourself on fire. And then you have to take into account the air, how moist of a night is it, because you might need a lot more gasoline than you think. And you also better be fast because you got to know the second you light that couch on fire, the police are coming. 5-0 is running around the corner, and you could light it on fire, be pumping your fist, and be going to jail just like that. You see, it takes more than simply wanting to light that couch on fire to make it burn. Now, I recognize the fact that this illustration may very well eat up my whole sermon, right? It will be the only thing that you remember, but we can get away with it on a time change Sunday, right? But it takes more than just desire to make that couch burn. It's, in fact, all of these other circumstances around it which allow that sort of thing to happen. And a lot of times we walk here into church and we simply have an overwhelming desire to burn for the Lord. God, I'm going to get serious today. God, today I'm going to be passionate for you. God, today is a day where you're going to do something significant in my life. I'm going to lay it all out there. And we come in here and we put up our hands and we pray our hardest and we walk out the door and we find ourselves remarkably unchanged. It takes more than simply intent to go ahead and follow the Lord in this sort of way. It takes more than just sort of uh, an intent to go ahead and have your heart burn. In fact, we need to surround our hearts with a sort of kindling that would actually allow it to happen, to actually allow the flames to take root. And so when you take a look here at Romans 12, he begins by saying, let your heart be set aflame. Keep your spiritual fervor. But in verse 12, he's going to actually tell us what the kindling is that makes that happen. We are not left alone with simply a command of be passionate about God, but he walks us through three things that are essential for actually burning for the Lord. Verse 12, be joyful in hope, be patient in affliction, and be faithful in prayer. I think oftentimes the things that quench this fire that burns for the Lord the most is that we are not joyful in hope. Instead, we begin to despair. We're not patient in affliction. Instead, we become overwhelmed by it and we lose heart. And we are not faithful in prayer. We slowly give up over time. We find that as we experience these things, 
we have a natural tendency to do the opposite of what's good for us. We begin to give up, to cower, to bend to it. And in fact, that very sort of flame that we have that wants to burn for the Lord, in fact, becomes quenched. He begins here by talking about the joyful heart, by having joyful hope. What does it mean to actually have hope? You know, we can actually do literally eight to ten sermons up here right now about hope because the Christian life is so focused on it. The Bible talks about hope literally all the time. It is one of the most central tenets of our faith is that we are to be a hopeful people, that we are not to be cynical Christians. We're to be people who always believe that good is right out there. And the reason why we believe that good is right out there and the reason why we hope is first and foremost found in the character and identity of God. We hope because we believe that God is good. We hope because we believe that God is big and that he is almighty and that there is nothing that can stand against him or oppress him or there is nothing that can oppose him. That God is mighty and good and he intends good for your life. That God cares about you and more than that, that God knows about you. God knows what's happening in your life. He knows about your struggles. He knows what's opposing you. And not only does he know about it, but he hates it. When God sees your struggle and when he sees your pain and when he sees how you're suffering, God looks at it and hates it to his core. And not only does he just simply hate it, he is committed to acting against it. It's what the cross is all about. He hated it so much that he went to the cross to die on the cross for you so that he could begin putting this world to right again. That he could begin fixing all the broken pieces which cut and tear us apart. God knows and God cares and God is mad about it. And oftentimes when you're struggling, knowing that God is mad about what, is ma- that what makes you mad is all you need to know, is that God cares and he is working against it. So our first thing, our content of our hope is in God's character. Not only that, but our, our content of our hope is in the fact that God has an eternal plan for us. You know, the early church starts amidst great trouble. It, admits, admits great, it starts amidst great persecution as the Roman government is coming down upon them as they are scattered out. I mean, it ends with Jesus dying on the cross and raising from the dead. But after there, that same persecution just carries out the church for the next three, four hundred years. And the church is struggling with it. And it's one of the things that Paul told them all the time was, yes, you are struggling now. Yes, this pain is real and it is overwhelming, but remember, your life here is merely a blip. That far after your life is over here, your life in eternity is going to go on because you are eternal in your soul. Your soul is going to live forever. Your body is going to die, but your soul is going to live on, and those in Christ will live on and be with him in heaven. And for all the suffering that we experience, there's this great reward that God is planning for us. And there's a great future that he is preparing for us. And there's things that he is doing on our behalf right now in heaven. It says the reason why he has not returned yet to gather us is that he is not done creating the good things that he has. And so frequently, whenever the church was oppressed or struggling or just beaten up, they would say, remember our hope that this is not all there is. There is something better that moves on forever that awaits us. Our hope is in God's character, but also in his future plan. But we're not merely left alone with the sort of ticket that we're waiting to punch, that I'm suffering here without purpose, and one day it's going to get better. No, in fact, that hope that we have eternally is meant to flow to today. You know, I had a fascinating conversation with Rob and Janet Orr uh, this week. Rob is one of our dear friends. He runs Life on the Hill, one of our former church chairmen. His wife, Janet, actually has a rare eye disease, which caused her to lose vision in one eye very suddenly. And this week, the other one almost went out. And she was in emergency surgery yesterday to try to save it with no guarantee that they will be able to. It is quite possible that early this week we'll find out that Janet has lost vision in both eyes suddenly and unexpectedly. And then talking to Rob, I said, Rob, can you share for me a little bit about your hope in this situation? Because Rob, it doesn't look very hopeful. And he says, you know, the fascinating thing about it is it is far harder than we ever thought to deal with. But at the same time, we find God to be closer and nearer and better to us than we ever expected. What a fantastic dichotomy that is right there. It is harder and is more overwhelming than I thought, but that God is good and better to me than I ever expected. I would not usually put those two things together. 
But somehow, in the midst of our suffering, it says that God comes close and he loves to comfort us. We can be joyful in hope because we know that God is good. We know that his plan is going to overwhelm. And that regardless of what we face here and now, it cannot overwhelm what God ultimately wants to do. That every situation God is able to redeem. You know, we got to see that a few weeks ago with Sally Shue up here uh, during Global Outreach Weekend. She was the woman who spoke and shared about the persecuted church in China. What was fascinating about Sally is the second she got going, everybody was like, dude, take the stage. Go. I don't, I don't want it. Go. You just do your thing. She was killing it up here, right? It was amazing to watch. And never once would you hear from her mouth about she was the victim in this. That the, the church oppressing her family, the church oppressing her, forcing Christians underground, not one moment did you ever get a sense that her life was anything left than overwhelmingly glorious. Because she knew God cared. She knew he had a plan. And amidst the pain, it overwhelmed even that. So that even amidst pain, we can be joyful in hope. Trusting in this crazy hope is hard. It is far easier to trust in crazy fear. For us to look out at the world and to imagine any number of endless scenarios that might happen that might throw our life even more off tracks. And what happens if the diagnosis does not come out well? What happens if I don't get a job here in the next year? What happens if my benefits run out and I can't go ahead and pay my bills? What happens if my kid keeps on down the same trajectory that they're on right now? And what if they don't make a U-turn? What if bottom is a long way off? And what if this thing just kind of keeps going downhill? It's easy for us to look at our lives and to imagine every fearful solution and to work ourselves into fits. It is far harder to trust God and say, I believe that you're good. I believe that you're working. and I believe that you can redeem even this. Being afraid takes our eyes off of God and it puts, us on, puts it onto the circumstances. It takes God off the throne and it puts chaos onto it. And it puts me into control over any number of things in my life which I cannot control. God calls us into a place of joyful hope and of believing. The second thing that he talks about is about being patient in affliction, about being patient in suffering. We are all aware of what it means to suffer. Whether you have suffered or whether you know somebody who has suffered, suffering is one of the basic truths of this world that it is broken and that we all hurt and that we all suffer. But oftentimes we take a look at our suffering and we never really think about it from another perspective. And I want to put that perspective onto that of Christ. And I want us to think a little bit bigger than the cross right now. I want us to think just about the life of Christ. Because Jesus is born to two teenagers who are not married, who are poor in the backwoods of Israel, to an oppressed people by the Roman government. In fact, we have these hints throughout the portions of Scripture that Jesus talks about his father, and all of a sudden, all the Pharisees jump on it and they say, Ah, who, who is your father, Jesus? Tell us who your father is. And when commentators see those verses, they think, you know, the story about Jesus' virgin birth is obviously out there. And you have people who don't believe. And so even as Jesus begins his ministry, you have people that are looking at him saying, we know your story. We know that you claim to be divine. We think this is one of those accidents and not believing it. Not only that, but we find that when Jesus begins his ministry at 30, his mother is present, his children, his, sorry, his, his children, his brothers and sisters are present. Who is most notably not present is Joseph. And it leads commentators oftentimes to believe that somewhere in Jesus' young life, Joseph died while he was still a young man. We find that as ministry begins, his family does not believe him. They mock him. They want him to stop. They pull him away from doing his ministry. We find that he is rejected by the Jewish people who he has gone to minister to, that he has called every sort of name that might have been hurtful to him, such as being called a liar or a blasphemer or a sinner or an alcoholic drunkard, or he is called demon-possessed. Every sort of name he is called. Eventually he is going to be arrested, and those people who he came to save are going to say, we would rather have a murderer amongst us than Jesus. He's betrayed by friends. He's denied by other friends. When he raises from the dead, other friends are going to say, we're not going to believe it till we can put our hands in his side. His death was the most horrific that they could come up with that day, but it did not compare to what happened to him on the cross when it says that God turned his back on him as he took all of the wrath of sin upon himself. 
that all of the punishment that waited for you and me, he took upon himself. Jesus fully knew what it was to suffer and was thus called a man of sorrows. And he suffered in this way because he was good, overwhelmingly good to a people that could not accept him. The question then is, how can I, as somebody who is not good, expect to suffer less than Jesus? If Jesus and all of his goodness suffered greatly, how could I ever expect that mine should be suffering free? It is the nature of this world, and let's be honest, those of us here in the States suffer far less than the Sally shoes of this world. But yes, we have this expectation that our lives should be free of suffering in Christ, and it quite simply is not true. It is the nature of this world and as being strangers in this world that we are going to suffer. But the comfort is that since he has known what it is to suffer, he is able to help. That he knows what it feels like to be you. He knows what it feels like to lose. He knows what it feels like to be taunted or mocked or to have a future that looks rather dark. He understands. And as thus, he's able to help the thing about suffering is oftentimes it feels so personal. I read a fascinating story about Beethoven who needs no explanation. Every one of us know him. He was that dog in the Disney movie. Um, <laughs> stupid joke. So Beethoven, not many people know that he actually went deaf throughout his career as a music writer. One of the most gifted, brilliant musicians ever to live actually slowly went, deaf, slowly went deaf to the point that he would go ahead and he tried to hide it from people. But as he was conducting, there's stories of him conducting with his wand and having the whole orchestra finish behind him and he has not realized that they've quit playing and the applause has begun. He's still going because he can't hear anything. It says that when he got the diagnosis that he is going deaf, that they could hear him pounding on the piano, yelling, I will take life by the throat. It was his way of denying that this deafness would define him or would overwhelm him, that he would beat it, that he would conquer it. And quite honestly, that is a way that most of us approach suffering, is we defy it, that it will not get us, that it will not overwhelm us, that we will win. It denies the fact of how much it hurts and what a challenge it is. Later on in his life, Beethoven wrote this incredible letter that is famous and you could read today, but he entered it with this. With joy, I hasten to meet my death, for he shall free me from my constant suffering. What happened to that man who pounded on the piano and said, I will take life by the throat? Over time, that denial of suffering gave way to a despair in it. He denied that it hurt. He denied it that it would beat him. But over time, over the course of years and years and years, slowly that denial gave way to despair. As Christians, we are not called to deny suffering because it's real and it hurts. But we're not called to despair in it because we have a hope. Instead, we are called, as it says here in Romans 12, to be patient in suffering. That I am to be patient in suffering. That's hard. Could we be honest and say that that is hard? My daughter, Matthew, prayed uh, for her. Has been in the hospital for the last four days. She's one year old. She has RSV, which is a sort of viral form of asthma that's pretty severe. And she's on the mend and slowly getting better. But she got sick when my wife went out of town for a girl's weekend. So here I am with three boys and my sick daughter going to the hospital trying to figure out how we're going to make this whole thing work. Guys, nobody wants to go to the, do the hospital without their wife next to them, with their baby daughter. Here I was as my wife drives 152 miles an hour down the freeway trying to get home. And over the course of those hours was a lot of shots, a lot of breathing treatments, a lot of getting her lungs pumped, a lot of tears. And it became difficult just to become patient in that. And that's four days. There's been people in this room who've been suffering for four months. There's been people who've been suffering in this room for four years. There's been people who've been suffering in this room for far longer than that. And being patient for four days should be easy for those of us who think we can muscle it up. But we find that we can be patient over time, but eventually it gives out, doesn't it? Whether in four days or four months or four years, simply saying, I'm going to be patient and wait and wait and wait. We're not called to simply be patient for patience' sake. We're called to be patient because we have hope. 
Our patience is rooted in hope. I can be patient through suffering because I know that God is good. I can be patient in suffering because I know that God is going to redeem all of this one day. And I know that God is going to come near to me now. So even as it hurts and even as I wait, I can be patient in it because I have this incredible hope through it. And he concludes here at the end of 12 where he says that we're to be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and be faithful in prayer. We talk all the time about how we need to pray more, right? Every single one of us out there feels that we need to pray more. This word built being faithful in prayer, I think is interesting though. If you take the word faithful apart and just put in some synonyms next to it, it gives us an idea about whether or not we're being faithful in prayer. Are you being constant in prayer? Are you being relentless in prayer? Are you being committed in prayer? Are you persisting? Are you habitual? Are you persevering in prayer? Or are you unfaithful in prayer? Are you sporadic? Are you intermittent? Are you occasional in prayer? Are you infrequent? Are you random? It's the difference between being faithful and being unfaithful in prayer. Again, if Paul must teach this and talk about this to the church, then it lets us know that this is a problem that is bigger than us, that this is a humankind problem, that we struggle to be faithful in prayer. We struggle to fight through it. But the reality is if I desire to have a heart that is set aflame by the Lord, I'm going to have to become more faithful in prayer, which that begs the question, how? How do we do it? 1 Thessalonians 5.17, I'm not going to ask that you go there, but I'm just going to tell you. It says that we are to pray without ceasing, which is a great way of spinning being faithful in prayer. We're to be praying without ceasing. So often we think of prayer as something I do in the morning or I do in the evening. It's something I do before dinner. It's something that I do in church. But if prayer is something that I'm to do without ceasing, then all of a sudden it becomes something that can no longer be logged in as simply a portion of the day or something that happens in a certain place or that happens with certain people. It is something that's going to need to extend out beyond that. It's going to need to be something that happens throughout my day. It's not going to always be something loud. It's going to be sometimes be something quiet. It's going to need to become an attitude or a quality of my life rather than merely a habit of it. If we're to pray without ceasing, that means that when we go ahead and go through our days, we're going to be called to be praying slowly and intentionally through it. When we are oppressed or when we deal with a difficult person, we're praying, God, help me give them grace. When we become angry, we're praying, God, God, let me not be controlled by this anger. When we all of a sudden we become hurt, we say, God, help me to forgive this person. When we become frustrated, we're saying, God, help me to let this go. When we see somebody hurting, we're praying, God, would you bless them? As we hear something good news or something overwhelms us, we praise God. We say, God, I'm thanking you for that. It becomes a quality of my life that's being lived out at all places and at all times. And I'm faithful in prayer again because I'm hopeful. I think quite often what happens is that when we suffer, we begin to believe something different about our theology. That somehow I'm suffering and God must not care that God must not be near, that this must be the plan, and there's nothing good that's going to come out of it, and I slowly begin to despair. And once I begin to despair and I begin to wonder if God is really good, then that is why oftentimes we frequently stop praying. It's not merely because we become lazy, although sometimes we do. Oftentimes the reason why we quit, quit praying is that we quit believing that it is powerful, that God is listening, and that he really cares. If I am a person who's defined by joyful hope, then it means that as I experience prayer, I'm going to recognize that I can speak to God, that God does care, that God is moving, speaking, and acting in this situation, and I can believe him to be in it and go to him all the more. And if we find that we become people who are defined by a joyful hope instead of crazy fears, if we find that we can become people who patiently wait through trial rather than defying it or despairing in it, 
if we find that we can be people who are defined by unceasing prayer instead of dwindling faith, that we find that our hearts and lives can be the sort of place that has kindling around it for the Spirit to begin to move, that we become the sort of person who's not merely holding a match to the world, but our whole lives begin to be set aflame for the Lord because the kindling for it has been set. I'm not merely trying harder, but I've made my life in a way that is set up to receive an abundance of his grace, an abundance of his power, and to now go ahead and magnify that to the world. Friends, it's not merely about coming in today and trying harder and raising your hands and closing your eyes and bringing your Bible and listening more. It's about taking our lives on the very bottom levels of it and choosing to think differently, to believe better, to try a little bit more. And as we go ahead and create our lives and begin to bring it around, defined by hope, defined by faith, defined by prayer, we find that our lives come alive. And we no longer need to ask God to set us afire because we find that we already are. The kindling has been set and the match has been lit and we no longer are striving for a moment, but we're living in a lifestyle of being aflame for the Lord. Let me pray for us. God, Lord, I would be remiss if I didn't start by just praying for Piper. (sighs) Lord, I pray that today could be a day where she begins to turn. Lord, she can come home today. Father, I pray for strength for Melinda and I to be good parents to our boys as we wait, um, as we wait for a season to end. And Father, we extend that prayer out to the people in this room, Lord, who are without hope but are filled with cynicism. People who are stuck in despair, or people who are just fighting, denying that it hurts. For people who have prayed so long that they quit, have quit believing that you care. God, we cry out to you. And we ask that you would not just merely set our hearts on fire, but our whole lives. Lord, that you would feel, fill us full of a zeal for you. Lord, that it would happen not by a flame that's struck by our hands, but by yours. Father, we love you. We ask that you give us the strength and patience to wait for the work that you want to do. We pray it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.